G'day everybody, and today on the Ross and Jono Show, we're gonna be talking about one of the greatest archeological discoveries of all time. How is it significant to the text of the Moses Scroll? There's one question I'm gonna have for you, Ross, and what does it have to do with Shapira? Because there is a connection, uh, perhaps. Yep. And, uh, and what's going on in the Bible's account of this particular uh, discovery? We're gonna be talking about all of that. This is this truly, as you said it in the kickoff, this is truly one of the greatest archaeological discoveries of all time. I'm telling it, you. It, it really is. I'm going to yep. set the stage. I'm going to set all the right. stage. When we were in Jordan last time, all right, uh, what year was that? When were we? That was 2022 November, was it? Yes. Yeah, I, I think so. The first trip. Okay. Okay, we were there and uh, we had just spent a magnificent day, an entire day, two nights in a five-star hotel, beautiful, overlooking um, Petra. Boy, it was good. It was so luxurious. And, and that particular day was just full of um, uh, adventure and exercise <laughs> yep. on, the, uh, on the Tanakh tour. Now, uh, if anyone's wondering, we are starting to discuss the next tour. There'll be information right. on that coming soon. Um, but but we're not going to talk about that just yet. But mm, the wheels are turning. Okay, so um, we left Petra in Jordan. We headed north towards the, the Wadi Mujib. This is the next stop. This is so important in our, our story, of course. And once again, the Moses Scroll. If uh, This is the textbook of the um, uh, series that we're doing. And as everybody knows that, that's read anything about uh, this topic, the scroll that has dominated our lives for the last four years, the Moses Scroll, was found in a cave in the Wadi Mujib. So we wanted to go there and speculate, whereabouts is this cave? And now we talked a bit about that in uh, last week's program, you know. Right. Um, the various caves and so on and so forth. You went into a cave. Okay, that's last, last week's program. But right. once we were done with the Wadi Mujib, uh, we said to our uh, tour guide, Aladdin, we said, um, uh, look, we'd really like to find this this particular place. Now, we were he was able to find it. This is not a place that um, a lot of tour buses go to, Ross. That's and, right. Uh, not at all. It, it, not at all. It took, it took a little while to pinpoint exactly where we were going. But once we arrived, we realized this is most certainly the place. The place is called Diban. And when we got there, we um, took home with us, uh, at, uh, upon searching around the, uh, the tell, uh, a piece of rock, a piece of basalt actually a small piece yeah. of basalt we both found one um do you have yours there by the way i i don't I have it in, yeah i have one somewhere but it's not exactly with me right now so we are going to explain uh why it is that we made that our souvenir all right we're in Daban. uh ross yep. pick up from there yeah okay so we knew we knew from the story that in August of 1868, a, uh, a a minister, a missionary by the name of Frederick Augustus Klein was on mm -hmm. a joy trip, a uh, sort of a refreshing trip east of the Jordan. Uh, he was uh, he had been in Jerusalem since 1851. This missionary, uh, Frederick Klein, oh really, and and he oh. had hired to guide him around the biblical sites east of the Jordan. Uh, he had hired an Arab, uh, very well-connected Arab guide. So he's traveling mm -hmm. around. He went to see the Gilead. He went to see all of the sites of the biblical places. And on the 19th of August, he settles in. He had uh, met with other Bedouins. They're at a camp where he's safe and secure. And around the fire, his guide tells him, I want to show you something. It's only a few minutes from here, but it's something no Western eye has ever seen. He said he, he really gets excited. So the long story is he goes to see that evening before sunset, but he only has a very limited time. He sees on the ground lying face up what we now call the Moabite stone or the Mesha Stella. Now, mm -hmm. he does not read uh, ancient Hebrew, but if people in this discussion, members of the Yakut, if you scroll up, you'll see, and I'll upload these later, you'll see, I want you to look at the brown sketch, the, the brown paper, the sketch on the brown paper. This is actually the sketch of Frederick Klein. Now, I got a copy. I took a photograph of this and have permission to publish it here, 
uh, because it's mm-hmm. a photograph of the actual object when I went with the Tylers to London and I went to the headquarters of the PEF because Frederick Klein is one of those who's connected with the Palestine Exploration Fund, which, right. by the way, Jonah, was only established in 1865. So three years after the establishment of the PEF, Frederick Klein sends this. Now, I, mm-hmm. I know you've got questions. Let me do, get one more little piece in. Go ahead. When he saw it, the first thing he did was, he, you know, he doesn't know antiquities, but he assumes that it must be ancient. He mm-hmm. sees the writing. He doesn't know the language, but he, he asked his, uh, the Bedouin that were there to flip it up so he can look at the back. Are there any other words written on the back? There was not. Lie, it's lying there. He draws. Uh, he, he counts the lines. There are about 34 lines, mm-hmm. and um, he represents, he draws a sketch of several of the letters uh, just so that he can show it to someone. He goes back to the camp. The next day, they make their way to Jerusalem. He shows it to uh, people more knowledgeable than he, and they immediately recognize it as an ancient, some sort of Phoenician script, paleo, not sure what it is, uh, but they immediately recognize how important it is. Go, Jono. I know you've got questions. No, it's just, I was just going to point out that um, uh, the Palestine Exploration Fund, you said, was established in 1865. It just so happens, of course, as we mentioned last week, that that was the year where the Bedouin discovered the scroll in the cave right. in the Wadi Mujib, the Wadi Mujib that you and I had just been in before we arrived at Taban. It was a beautiful evening. The sun was just setting, and uh, and we had time to tell this story that we're talking about now. So this is only three years after um, the Palestine Exploration Fund was established three years after the Moses Scroll was discovered in a cave. Uh, yep. 1868, this is um, 10 years before Moses Shapiro would ascri- would um, uh, acquire that scroll. Ross? Yep. One thing I wanted to kind of kick us off early with, so this is discovered by Frederick Klein. Now, that sets off a race, Jono, uh, a mm-hmm. race between – the Western countries of the world, basically. What you had in the 1860s, a lot of stuff was going on. The world is opening up finally to safe passage, eh, somewhat Mm. safe passage from all areas of the world to uh, the Levant, to the ancient Holy Land. And people went there, Mm. as the old saying goes, with spade in one hand, Bible in the other, and they're looking for ancient artifacts and evidence that the Bible is true. And Jonah, we're going to talk tonight about one of the most, uh, I would say, one of the most significant proofs of Mm -hmm. at least a portion of the biblical text being verified and true archaeologically. So this, I'm going to read you a paragraph from uh, what is called the autobiography of Sir Walter Besant. Now, Besant was the secretary of the PEF, Palestine Exploration Fund, uh, at the time of this discovery and for several years. He's also very familiar with our man Shapira, which he mentions in this piece. So here we go. Mm -hmm. This is Besant. He says, now this is later in life he's recalling. He says, in the course of my work at the Palestine Exploration Society, I was connected officially with one great discovery— and one great fraud. All right, now get this. The discovery was that of the Moabite stone, an event which forced the world to acknowledge the historical character of part, at least, of the Old Testament. The discovery was made by a German missionary employed by the English society, and he goes on and describes it. He then, after a page, uh, a little more than a page, he describes what he considered to be the greatest fraud. Now, Mm -hmm. here's something I want to make a point of at this very juncture in our discussion tonight. I say, and you say, and other experts who've really studied it, I'm not talking about the scholars who weigh in and know nothing. Even some scholars who've interviewed me, (coughs) name undeclared at the present, who say, (laughs) I just think it's a forgery. Well, you've not studied Mm -hmm. it, so how do you know? Mm -hmm. But here's the deal. Fragments 
uh, Seth and I produced a video. We're going to put the link in the description of this one called Fragments of Stone and Skin. I suggest to you oh, nice. and our audience that both the fragments of st- skin that came from Moab and the fragments of stone that came from Moab are both authentic. One has been almost universally declared authentic. The other almost universally declared uh, a fraud. They're both real. Get ready. Mm. We're going to prove it. And before uh, too long, I hope to have real solid evidence in, in the, uh, uh, the, the reality, the authenticity of the fragments of skin. Okay. Good deal. Now, now. Uh, you mentioned a couple of things. One of them is the account in the Bible um, that he mentions uh, or makes reference to in the letter. That is, of course, Second Kings chapter 3, I do believe. That's um, right. People can turn there. We're going to be talking about that in just a minute. The other thing we're going to be talking about is, now you mentioned fragments of stone. We, don't, we, haven't, we haven't told them why there's fragments yet. We'll get there. Um, That's right. But this is the reason why we were picking up fragments of stone and yep. uh, and took one each back with us as a souvenir. Uh, Claremont Gano, uh, there is a there is a rush, and uh, as you mentioned, of, of people flocking, literally flocking to the holy city of Jerusalem um, with a with a spade in one hand and Bible in the other, as you say, uh, in order to discover something authentic to take home with them. You know, that's right. And uh, and this turns out to be an enormously significant uh, archaeological find. And uh, it's not something that can simply be put in one's pocket or even put on the back of a mule and, and, and taken away. Uh, it's a little bit too big for that. It's a little bit too heavy. Yep. Uh, and people are rushing to secure it for their own nation and try and bring it back to their own museum. And it's proving a little bit difficult. What's going on? Ross? Look, I, l- let me just underscore. This is without a doubt, even to this day, Jono, this is... I would venture to argue that it's in the top three of all archaeological discoveries tied to the biblical text. I would say it's in the top Mm. three. And and in Mm -hmm. that list, I'm saying also the Siloam inscription, also the Dead Sea Mm -hmm. Scrolls. And and here's the point I want to make before I get into the details. Moses Shapira is tied to all three. The Moabite stone, the Mesha Stella, mm-hmm. the Siloam inscription in a big, big way that is only mm. brought out by my recent research, and the Dead Sea Scrolls, as we'll see as we get into this. So when I was doing my research for the Moses Scroll, I almost didn't include this segue into the Moabite stone or this, this I thought it was sort of a diversion at first. But you Mm -hmm. can't tell the story of Shapira without it. So I I dug in very early in the research, and I pulled up every 19th century paper, article, uh, academic, book, you name it, anything on the Moabite stone. And then Mm -hmm. I, I pulled all that together and produced a narrative that's heavily footnoted that describes the story in the Moses Scroll. This is like chapter... Uh, two and three, and maybe a little bit into four. It turns out it was a major part of the research. One of the books that I used um, is a book that, uh, let's see, let me pull this up so that I can give the title. It's called Moab's, or Moab's Patriarchal Stone, Being an Account of the Moabite Stone, Its Story and Teaching by James King in 1878. So I downloaded this. It's a it's a PDF. You can find it online, mm-hmm. and it was in the public domain. So I downloaded it. I printed it. I read it carefully, marked it up. One of the things that I learned, and then I'll tell the story quickly, is that mm. a man by the name of Christian David Ginsburg, who's going to be a big player in our Shapiro saga, a lot of familiar names. Yeah, he he wrote a book called The Moabite Stone. And and I am going to tell you about this because Mm -hmm. this one is published in 1871. It's called The Moabite Stone, a facsimile of the original inscription with an English translation and historical critical commentary, 1871. Mm -hmm. I, I looked for a copy of it, and I found, this has got a cover on it, I found a copy advertised on eBay for $8, Jono. 
Mm. And guess what? It's an original. It's from oh, 1871. Are you serious? It's fallen That's to so pieces, cool. yeah. But anyway, so I ordered right. it, and, and I pull all this information together. And, and mm. in, in a very brief, concise way, the story is, is that the Prussians, because Klein goes back to Jerusalem, he tells uh, the local municipality, friends of his, tied to his organization, and the mm. Prussians at that point seek to get approval to buy. That approval is granted in quick turnaround, and then they set forward with a plan to send an Arab uh, to go negotiate. This turns into a circus. I highly recommend people read the book. In fact, mm. Jonah, let me say this to our viewers. If you don't have a copy of the Moses Scroll, listen to this deal. Do you know that you can go online and when you click the sample on Amazon, they can mm -hmm. actually mm -hmm. read this entire chapter without spending a oh. dime. At least. Oh, so you, you, have this, you have this chapter uh, available to read yeah. as a sample. Beautiful. Absolutely. We'll do that. Go, go to Go to Amazon. Uh, you can get it in hardcover. You can get it in paperback. You can get it in Kindle and have it immediately if you so desire. But this is our textbook, of course. All right. That's well, right. That. Okay. That's great. Now, okay, so here's the deal. One of the things that, that happens is, so the Prussians uh, are trying to get this. Now, they've hmm. been beat out of a prior uh, something else. So, so they're really fighting to get this. We'll get into that later hmm. in the story. Uh, but in the meantime, the English hear about it. Now, these English are gentlemen. They decide not to move as long as there is a negotiation open between the Arabs, the Bedouin, and the Prussians. So they don't mm. move on it. And then as time goes on, we're talking over a period of eight, nine, ten months, a year, a Frenchman by the name of Monsieur Charles Clermont Ganot. He's a young guy. He's brilliant, 22 years old, um, and he hears about this, and he decides finally, after no progress is made with the Prussians, for reasons you have to read about to believe, mm. he makes his move. Now, he, sends a, he, he sees a transcript of a few of the letters. Now, he's a dragoman which means he's fluent in Hebrew and Arabic and in various languages of the region. What? I'm sorry, what is that word? That is such a, a cool word. He's a what? A, he's a dragoman, D-R-A-G-O-M-A-N. It was a very, uh, in Ottoman, what was called Ottoman Palestine. I'm not talking the mm -hmm. political term Palestine, but in the 19th century, that entire Levant region, region is referred mm -hmm. to as Palestine. But these dragomans are, uh, they're more than guides. They are guides, but they are interpreters. They are, they know the people of the land and they can work between Arab and Jews and you name it. Mm. Uh, and so he was one of those. He was assigned, he was on assignment by the French. He, he's hasty, he's young, he's energetic, and he wants, mm. vive la France. He wants France right. to win the race. So he, he had seen Salim Al-Khari had made a... We talked about briefly last, yeah, last week. Yep, go ahead. He, he made a few lines, a transcription of a few lines on this monument, Moab's monument, the Moabite mm. Stella, and had given it to a banker by the name of Bergheim. Bergheim, that we're going to have a test on all these names and details... Bergheim shows it to Claremont Gano. Claremont Gano says, I must have this stone. Mm -hmm. So then he, he launches out uh, an attempt. And the quick story is that one of the guys who's part of this Arab team that Claremont Gano sends to Moab to get a squeeze, he mm -hmm. wants to see what the inscription, the total inscription is. Now, a squeeze okay, so just is... Yeah, I was, was going to say, just remind everybody yeah, what, what a squeeze it, is. Yeah. It's, it's like a paper mache. Uh, you, you take paper, a heavy paper, and you mm. wet it, and then you mash it onto a, a, uh, an ins a stone that's been inscribed, and you push this wet paper into the engraved letters. 
And what you do is you let it dry. And when it dries, you carefully pull it off and you have a reverse image of the inscription. So that one of the guys he sends is a guy by the name of uh, Jacob Karavaka. And Jacob Karavaka and a team of other Arabs, they do this. and And in the midst of this process, the locals realize that this has got to be worth something. So there, a fight erupts, and uh, one of the men gets stabbed in the leg with a spear. Uh, in the the not yet dried um, squeeze is ripped off, torn in seven pieces, and he jumps on a horse and he rides back to Jerusalem. J- this Jonah, we have to make of- a movie. We have to make a movie Wait. about this. We <laughs> we've seen this in action uh, where. Um, uh, the possibility of making some money um, becomes competitive between Bedouin and all of a sudden the fight uh, breaks out. We, we've seen that happen before our eyes. We have. Um, yeah. We, we really have. And and the reason why this happens, uh, and we were in Petra, by the way. <laughs> the yeah, that's right. I remember. Happens, um, is because uh, Clermont Gonneau turns up the demand for this particular item that's just – one item, who's going to make the money on it? Clearly, there's a, a, a high amount of demand, and they want that piece of the action. There's only one piece, though, yep. Ross. What are they going to do? I tell you, it gets really, really intense. I mean, the story from this point on, the, the fight continues ultimately, and very uh, a few months later, when they realize that there's money to be had and that the fight is really going on, in the mm. midst of this, the Pasha, the Ottomans, because the Bedouin, are, they keep going back and forth with the potential buyer, and they say, mm. well, you could, you could pay me, but you also have to carry it through this Bedouin tribe's land, so the price is also going to be charged for transport there. Mm-hmm. The Prussians get fed up. The French are fed up. The English are fed mm-hmm. up. And ultimately, a letter is written to the, um, the Ottoman authorities. Now, yep. the Ottoman authority at the time, uh, the Pasha Rashid, issues a verdict to the Bedouin and says, y'all, he didn't say y'all, but this is my southern uh, translation, Y'all better give that thing up. Now, the Bedouin already hate the Pasha. They already hate the Ottoman authorities because the Ottoman authorities are enforcing strict rules called the Tanzimat reforms on them, and so mm-hmm. they rebel. And they say, and I'm not far from quoting here, they say, mm-hmm. to hell with him. We're going to show him what we're going to do. And they take what was at the time a perfect, no blemish. I mean, it was in perfect situation at when they discovered it, the, the Moabite stone. They dug a hole, put it into the hole, and Now, when built you say they, sorry to interrupt, Ross, but when you Bedouin. say they, um, the Bedouin, and, and the particular Bedouin tribe is the um, Bani, Bani Hamidah, Bani is Ham- correct? Hamidah, yeah. And they, they okay, so build, they are the custodian tribe of this particular um, uh, relic, if you like. Okay, they that's build right. a, a pit. Go ahead. They build a pit. They build. They get this thing so hot. They they build the fire around this black basalt um, um, monument, and it, it's almost glowing from descriptions. And mm. at the same time, as cold water is thrown onto the top of this. Moabite stone, which was no broken pieces, they also mm. threw huge stones onto it and shattered it. Mm. The most, one of the most important objects, even now, this is what we've been saying the whole show, was it was shattered into pieces. Now, mm. if you will look at the photo that I uploaded in the chat. The, the, the picture of the Moabite stone that we are used to seeing looks like a Frankenstein almost. And I'm, I'm using that description because you'll see that there is there's some areas that are really black and dark, 
There are mm. cracks all through it, and then there are some uh, parts of the stone which are um, right. more brownish in color. So let now, me, now, let me, if, yeah. if I may uh, interrupt just for a second. So uh, if, if people look at the, say, the wiki, for example, uh, on the uh, Meshastella, the Moabite stone, yep. it will say that uh, Clermont Gonneau later managed to acquire the fragments and piece them together thanks to the impression made before the Stella's destruction. And that's the squeeze that you're talking about. That's but right. did he, Ross, did he actually get all of the pieces and, and piece he, them back together like a jigsaw he, puzzle? He did not get all the pieces. In mm. fact, if you look at the photograph, and, and you've, you've given, I'm going to have this uh, link to this uh, photograph in the description of the video, but also mm. on the Yakad, you get all these documents and photos we're talking about. But there are really two big pieces. Now, what we believe is that the original monument had 34 lines, and we estimate 1,000 characters. What we've recovered are two big, big pieces. You'll see them mm -hmm. in the photograph. They're the lighter color of the monument that's been restored. Uh, and then a few other small pieces that are pieced together. Now, Claremont Gano, mm -hmm. ultimately the other nations, uh, Charles Warren, some of the guys from England and so forth, whoever got a piece, they did hand them over to Claremont Gano. Claremont Gano, in his defense, although I think he's part of the reason the thing got blown up to start with, oh, no doubt. he mm. rushed it, and and mm. he's the bad guy in my story. So he's a he's a bad That's guy. True. We're gonna we're gonna prove that over right, the course right. of this. But mm. but nonetheless, he puts it together, and part of the reason he's got a squeeze that's been torn into seven pieces. He puts it back together. It's not easy. And he mm. has uh, lines 7 through 13 of a 34-line inscription. 7 through 13 uh, were drawn by Salim Alakari. Remember that name, folks. Mm -hmm. He puts mm -hmm. it together, to to and in very short order, he publishes, here is my book on the Stella de Moab. So right. Claremont Gano publishes, as does... Christian David Ginsburg. Within mm -hmm. the next uh, couple of years, everybody is talking about the the Moabite stone, and mm -hmm. uh, and so. But here, what we'll talk about now, if whenever you're ready to move on, is the story well, of the Stella. Well, yeah, because I, I was just going to say the what we see in the Louvre in in Paris uh, is, um, as you just mentioned, parts that were pieced together. And of course, um, the, the, the remainder of the jigsaw that is missing is filled together using that squeeze, uh, that was taken. And, um, but even that representation doesn't truly, uh, capture it, its, uh, initial original shape, which was what more like an oval shape, whereas this is now like a tombstone, Ross, is that right? That's right, and and I've uploaded the picture from the sketch of Klein, and what he did, he says that it's rounded on both the top and the bottom, whereas mm -hmm. when Claremont Gannot, who never saw it before it was blown to pieces, he never mm -hmm. saw it, and he's so arrogant, and he did not listen, Klein has already described how it looked. But see, Claremont Gannot is Mr. Know-it-all, and he, he builds everything. it the way he wants it to. He so wants it to be. By, um, so, yep. You know, no, I, I was just going to say. So, so if I understand you correctly, the lighter pieces that, and and again, you can look. Ross has put the pictures in the chat, but the lighter yeah. pieces are original. The darker pieces are the the recreation. Those darker pieces that are recreated, the original pieces are still missing. They're still somewhere in 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 Moab. Still somewhere That's in Jordan, right. perhaps in Dubai. That's right. Yeah, and, this and is by the, the way, why we were picking up that's right. Like that. there it is. Now, now what we what we also know is that when this uh, beautiful ancient relic was blown to smithereens, mm. various Bedouin picked up pieces of the rock and put them in their granaries because the Bedouin are a uh, at least generally it's it's described the Bedouin people are described as sort of a superstitious people. And they believe that this is an ancient relic that brings good luck to their land. So you take a, mm -hmm. a hunk of this ancient rock and you put it in your granary 
and and you know that that's believed so to bring good luck. Let me luck. ask you a question about that. Let me ask you a question about that. Do you think that's actually the reason, or did they? That, so here's the question: Did they blow it up out of spite? Um, yes, and then yeah. hide and then and then hide it because they thought that it was uh, you know they had a superstitious optimism about you know uh, this this particular relic, or did they blow it up to create? Um, more pieces by which they could bargain and individually uh, uh, benefit financially from from selling these pieces. Y yes, yes, and yes. Yes, they blew it up because they were spiteful and they wanted mm -hmm. to show the the Ottoman authorities, you have you you are not my boss. You you can't make mm -hmm. me give this thing up. It's not yours. Your decision to tell me we are the chiefs of the desert. Who are you? Mm -hmm. To tell us anything. Second, they did believe that the pieces brought good luck, and so they took them to their granaries and their tents and everything. But they and would be willing to part with that good luck for a reasonable amount of money, is what you're saying. Everything has a price, Jono, and and everything has a price. Yeah. No, yep. I was just going to say. Sorry, I was just going to say because we see this very same behavior when it comes to the um, Dead Sea Scrolls, do we not? Like on multiple Amen. occasions. They tore up the scrolls in order to have more pieces to sell and and to slowly show, uh, slowly get more money. Absolutely. Uh, when they realized that that um, that it was worth something. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's yep. keep going. And so, so what we have is as the thing as Claremont Gano pieces this together, he interprets this. And and by the way, think about this. And I'm giving rough estimates. So say. I think most uh, scholars even today will say that we we have recovered about uh, 613 of the 1,000 uh, parts of this manuscript. So roughly 60%. And it it is without argument. Like no one that mm -hmm. I know of argues that the monument says, I am Mesha. Now, people can look up the, the, the translation of this Stella, but basically, mm. it is, uh, it's written in the first person mm -hmm. as if it is a monument declaring the wonderful deeds and achievements of a king by the name of Mesha, which we know from the Bible. So, mm. so Mesha, uh, Mesha, as we would say, uh, is... A worshiper of the god Chemosh. You can C H E M O S H. Chemosh mm -hmm. is one of the gods of Moab. We find stories of this god in the Hebrew Bible. We know mm -hmm. of uh, the Israelites' neighbors' gods, and this is one of them. Now, he is saying in this monument, he tells us this interesting story about how uh, a king, Omri, which we also know of the Bible, and his mm -hmm. sons, and, and he tells the story about how the Israelites had subjugated the Moabites. And, and so you can imagine, as this story hits the papers, you, this is the first time, and to this day, Jonah, it's one of the only ancient monuments, uh, ancient archaeological discoveries that confirms various details uh, mm. From the Hebrew Bible. So we know that there is a god of Moab by the name of Chemosh. We know that there's a king named Mesha. We know that there is an Omri, who is the king of Israel, whose son Ahab, um, it, 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 that the rebellion of Moab takes place during this king's reign. Mm. And so they immediately, almost immediately identify some even tie in that First Chronicles 20 is sort of a, a high-level overview of the same event, too, which we'll talk about later. But anyway, mm -hmm. uh, this Second Kings 3 tells this story. On the death of uh, Ahab, the, the son named Jehoram, Mo, uh, Moab rebels. I mm -hmm. think it's because you have a, a quick succession of kings. After Ahab dies, you have Ahaziah. Ahaziah only reigns for a couple of years, and then Jehoram. Now, during this time, 
the king of Moab believes, I think I can get out of paying this exorbitant amount of sheep because he's having to pay Israel in sheep and stuff. Exorbitant it, indeed. It says It says 100,000 lambs uh, uh, to the king of Israel and the wool of 100,000 rams. I mean, that is that's an incredible tribute to pay. Absolutely. Uh, and I think he thinks, we, we get this by piecing the two stories together, I think he thinks Israel's in political turmoil. They've had three mm. kings in, you know, I'm talking about northern kingdom of Israel, three successive mm. kings. The last thing they're doing is paying attention to the, the neighbors. That, well, he misjudged because Jehoram says, hey, I'm going to launch a campaign against the king of Moab. This is 2 Kings 3. So he mm -hmm. gets with Jehoshaphat who is the king of Judah, and he says, mm -hmm. hey, will you help me? Because, you know, I was getting a lot of money from uh, uh, our neighbor here, Moab, and he's saying he's not going to pay. For whatever mm -hmm. reason, maybe there is a recorded, uh, a not recorded uh, promise that he would give him some of it. Jehoshaphat says, I'm with you. Your people are my yep. people. Let's go get him. On the way, they decide that they're going to go to the south. They, mm -hmm. they make their way to the south through Edom, which is towards the bottom of the Dead Sea. So they're going yep. from north to south. They pick up, this is a strange story, but Edom says, I'm in, baby. You're, we're all blood brothers. <laughs> so the strange. king of Edom. Yeah, yeah that's it. He, they're, they're all in on that. like, this is great. All right. So uh, all three kings um, converge at the south end of the Dead Sea. They come down underneath and they begin, I guess that's the Wadi Zered, right? Am I right? Yep, yep. Um, uh, to come up on the east side of the Wadi, uh, uh, yep. of the Dead Sea, and prepare for attack, Ross. Now, right before they, they get ready to launch the war, um, Jehoram and and the, the boys, dis hey, this is bad. Not only, I mean, they're, they think they're going to die of, th of thirst, like there's a lack mm. of water, they're, they're really it's concerned. Dry. And, yeah, it's, dry. it's very, very dry. So the idea... No the idea is we need to do something. Uh, we need to consult. We need God on our side, as Bob Dylan's song puts it. So uh, this was before Dylan's time. But nonetheless, they, they okay. say we need a prophet. We need a prophet. Yeah. And Jehoshaphat uh, is, is favored by this particular prophet. We know this prophet. Mm. By the way, the timing of this, just to orient people, uh, Seth and I are working on our Northern Prophet series research. Oh yeah! Mm -hmm. At the end, right at the when this thing goes down, we have Elijah. Just to put it in context, Elijah Eliyahu Hanavi has just been taken to heaven in a chariot of fire. Elisha mm -hmm. is has just sicked two female she bears and killed forty two kids because they said. Hey, you bald head, get out of here. Yeah, hey, you bald no head, hair. you ain't got no <laughs> hair, bald head. And the bears come out of the woods and eat 42 children. This is right yeah. after all this. Totally happened. just, by the way. Yes, yeah. indeed. You Don't make fun of bald-headed people. So so then, Jono, what yeah. happens as a result of this is the, they say, you know what? There is a prophet named Elijah. And then mm. everybody said, don't make fun of the man's lack of hair. But let's get him down here. Bears. Lions and tigers yeah. and bears, oh my. <laughs> yeah, let's get him down here. So, so they do. Now, Elisha shows up, and Elisha makes some promises. He says, listen, uh, first of all, he didn't want to help the king of Israel because he's not, kings... He's not happy about being there. Uh-uh. Um, no. He says, he says, were it not that I respect King Jehoshaphat uh, uh, of Judah... I wouldn't even look at you or notice you. He says yeah. to the other kings, I guess specifically to Israel, he yeah. doesn't like him. And then he says, now, now, get me a musician on oh, music. Yeah, you bring the music in and things change. Mm -hmm. So he he decides that he, if it wasn't for Jehoshaphat, now he likes Jehoshaphat, he, or at least he respects him somewhat. Uh, we do mm. know from the records that Jehoshaphat is uh, at least uh, better than most of the northern kings. So he decides to do it. Now, he promises, Jono, he, mm -hmm. he tells them, listen, water is not going to be a problem. You're going to have water, 
And he he gives him a commitment. I'm just paraphrasing. This is uh, 2 mm-hmm. Kings chapter 3. He says, uh, the pools are going to be filled with water, and you're going to kick their tail. You're going to beat the enemy, and yay, yay, go rock and roll. We're going we're gonna to tear this place up. There'll, there'll be no wind. There'll be no rain, but there will be pools of water. So um, it, it implies that it's coming up from the ground. As we see, you know, when we visit um, uh, En Gedi, for example, directly That's opposite right. the, the Dead Sea of the Wadi Mujib, um, the water just comes up from the ground. It's beautiful. Uh, natural spring there, and I guess that's what's going on now. Is this? Is this? I, mean, I don't know if we know. Is, is he referring to the Wadi Zered? Is that where they are? Is that where the, he's in that area? Are? Yes, he's in that yes, area. He, All right, he's in that on. area. And right. and what is interesting, and I'm going to show you something here. I, I was telling Seth about this the other day. Um, the next morning, the the next morning after the prophet is says, "You go, boys. You're going to win this. Mm. God's on your side." You're going to beat Moab, and and you're going to take all their cities, and all this stuff's going to be yours. Yay, yay, yay. The Moabites wake up in the morning, and it's quiet. And they we've been in that desert plenty of times. Imagine, mm. it's total stillness. You can mm. see the Dead Sea. The water is sort of got mm. these purplish hues to it. Mm. There, it blue, mm. and, 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 and then, Jono, he notices that Moabites notice pools of water around the Dead Sea, not the Dead Sea, but pools of water around the Dead Sea that are mm. the color of blood. Now here's around where, where they're people, camped. So, yeah. so maybe there's a red sky in the morning, you know, like maybe there's a little bit of cloud cover, the, the sun is rising uh-uh. and there's a, a no, nothing like that? No, what let you, me tell you, you th- here's the deal. Let's say you're a local. You're a local hmm. and you're from Moab, downtown Moab. It, you've seen yep. every day of your life, you've seen the, the certain skies and the certain cloud cover. Hmm. This is sure. something different. Now, mm-hmm. here's what I know it is. I know this. September of 2021, there was something happened in the world that set the world on fire fire in a way, the evangelicals, Jews, uh, secularists, atheists, scientists all converge at the sight of some kind of phenomena in the Mm. pools around the Dead Sea. They looked like blood. Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so the scientists were called in. It's No one had ever seen this. Now, here's what people said. YouTube videos, Google it. You'll see September 21. Mm. Uh, 2021, Dead Sea pools blood. They're going to say, mm. oh, it's a miracle of God. It's going to be just like God turned the waters to blood in uh, in in the Exodus story. Oh, wait, wait, no, no, no. It's, it's the story from the book of Revelation, the water turned to blood. And you know what I said? I was right in the middle of, of studying all this, and I said, mm-hmm. look, it's in 2 Kings chapter 3. It's rare. It's not something mm-hmm. that they see every year in the fall when the sky looks a certain way. Whatever it was, and we now think that it has something to do with a certain algae and a certain, but it's not mm. common. So, but here's what happened. Get off of that for a minute. Now, here's what the mm. Moabites said. These three kings, Israel, Judah, and the Edomites, we can't believe they're all together anyway. We think that they've killed one another. They, they, the truce is off. The, the, the confederacy is over, mm. and they slaughtered, and it is blood. And then all of a sudden, mm. here's the story. All of a sudden, up popped from behind the wadis. You know, yee, yay, 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 the Israelites and the Moabite. I mean, the Israelites and, and the, the Judites and the Edomites. Yep. So. Moab's king, Mesha, according to the biblical account, says, I think I got a better chance fighting the Edomites. So he charges the Edomite lines. He's getting, he's getting waxed, just like mm. Elisha in the Bible said he would. And it mm. tells the story where he everything's going. And then listen to this. I want to read one verse to you, and you tell me what you think in 2 Kings chapter 3. And it's, uh, I think it's verse 27. Do you have that open already? Well, start, yeah. start from 26. Start from 26, yeah. Okay, 26. When the king of Moab saw that the battle was going against him, 
he took with him 700 swordsmen to break through opposite the king of Edom, but they couldn't do it. Then he took mm-hmm. his firstborn son who was to succeed him and offered him as a burnt offering on the wall. And great wrath came upon Israel, so they withdrew from him and returned to their own land. What? That is so bizarre. That is just one of the most, that's one of the more bizarre pieces of the book. I mean, there's a lot of really curious things in the Tanakh, obviously, but this is certainly one of them. Um, why Why he, is that, Jonah? Why, why does that well, strike you as strange? Give me some reasons. Because because we don't really know what that means. Great wrath falls upon Israel from whom? Yeah. From Chemosh? From 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 God? From yeah. the Moabites? Or or is it Israel who is consumed with great wrath because um, Mesha has sacrificed his own son uh, in such a public way before them to a, to appease Chemosh uh, to win him the victory? He's yeah. desperate to win the victory, and and so much so that he feels that it's justified to take the life of his own son. Um, the great wrath. And, and and not only that, but from wherever this wrath is coming from and being directed, it results apparently in Israel going, that's it, we've had enough going home now. But what's the way that you take it, Ross? I, I, this is the point. It's Elisha says, you're going to go in, you're going to take all the cities, you're going to win, you're going to win, everything's going to go your way, and it doesn't. It Mm. doesn't. They leave, great wrath comes upon Israel, and they leave. Okay. Now, whatever that means, I'm with you. I'm not so sure I have it nailed down, but here's the interesting piece. When the uh, Moabite stone was discovered and it was interpreted and transcribed and uh, pieced back together. The story mm. that emerged, people immediately saw that it was as it's often described the story of this battle, but from the Moabite side. And, mm-hmm. and as you might imagine, there are going to be differences. You know, the Israelites are going to tell it one way, the Moabites are going to tell it another. Now, as a Bible man, I might say, well, the Bible's right and the Moabite stone is wrong if there are differences, but it's perspective. Here's something mm-hmm. that I find striking. We have the right people involved in this story on both of these uh, on the stone and in the biblical text. Mm-hmm. And, and what some scholars have noted is that there are 18 points of congruence between the biblical text and the Moabite, the Mesha stone. Mm-hmm. Now, the other thing is they both basically end up the same way. Moabite stone is going to say that we chased Israel with their tail between their legs. The Hebrew mm-hmm. Bible says, uh, well, we left. Great wrath came upon Israel and we left. I suggest that both are telling the same story from different perspectives. Now, what we don't know is that if the Israelite version, if they if Mesha really did offer his son as a sacrifice, or we don't mm. that's the Israel, it's clearly the Israelite story. But mm. uh we don't read that in the Moabite Stella. And you might say, well, if you're the king of Mesha, you're not gonna report that part you, but you might not but it's not in in that day and age it's certainly not far-fetched to imagine that um there are cultures doing uh, exact such things we have we have a couple of uh, cross references to point to um like uh, uh Micah chapter 6 verse 7 for yeah. example that um you know that, that posits shall I conduct myself in such a way should I even go to such extremes uh people can read that but um so it may have happened could yep. happen. Now, two two quick uh, points that that I would encourage people to really look up, and and I cover a lot of this in in the book, but in the Moses Scroll. But in addition to just general, uh, uh, I guess, similarity between Second Kings three and the Mesha Stone, you also hmm. have the uh, mention if if modern scholars are right, there are a couple of scholars who have put put forward. Andre Lemaire, for instance, in 1994, put forward that a line uh, 31 in the 34 lines of text, he read that Mm. as Beit David, the house of David. If he's right, 
Now, it's argued by people like Matthew Rochelle and others in a recent mm -hmm. article in Bar Magazine. Mm. But if he's right, this is one of the earliest references to the House of David uh, that's ever been discovered. And then mm. there's, mm. there's one other uh, interesting word that shows up, and you might want to talk about that. Do you know where I'm going with this? The, the name uh, of... The, 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 the name of the Tetragrammaton is there. Is That's, it right. That's right. Mm. That's right. That's right. And, and, and this is a fascinating. I, I find this particular reference uh, very interesting because it says that he uh, took um, sacred items from the shrine of, of um, uh, Jehovah, if I remember correctly. Correct yeah. me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Uh, and what that suggests is that in that vicinity there on the other side of the Wadi Mujib, somewhere there, or, or, or perhaps around Mount Nebo, I don't know, um, it was uh, inhabited by perhaps Levites, Ross. Um, yeah. Perhaps it was the Levitical city. Um, perhaps there was a, a, a shrine, perhaps where Moses was entombed, um, and there was a, um, a sacred items there. Chemosh uh, uh, takes great pride in telling us that he took all of that. He took That's all right. that stuff and devoted it uh, within his own um, uh, temple to Chemosh. Have I got that right? That's it. Now, hmm. I want to say um, we're 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 coming up on the end, but I want to I want to tie a couple of things quickly. And you're welcome to jump in at any point if you have questions or comments. Well, uh, I, yeah. I I only have two questions, and I think I think you're going to address those. I, okay. I have one quick, and maybe you can do these quickly within closing up. Um, what? Very briefly, are the overlaps in the text itself? What sort of similarities do we see in the text of the Meshistella that are significant uh, when we compare to the um, Moses Scroll? The other question is: Is there not a rumor in um, not a rumor? Is there an account in the daughter of, of Jerusalem? Um, uh, Moses Shapira's daughter makes reference to him having encountered the Meshistella. First, am, am I right about that? This is just a couple of questions that I'd love for yep. you to address. So the I'll do the second one because what what I want to do I have it open. You you nailed it. Your memory is sharp as ever. In Little Daughter of Jerusalem, Miriam Harry uh, Shapira's daughter mm. wrote, and and I'll just cover up. I'll just cover a bit of this. Uh, she refers to her father by the. She uses false names in the text. Uh, but mm. we know that the Benedictus is the name she uses for Shapira. We and we'll get into why that is later. But anyway, she oh. says he, her father, Shapira, was keenly interested in making antiquarian researches. And he had taken Salim, who had finished his term of imprisonment, all right, whatever, <laughs> into his service. Okay. The latter. Salim, overjoyed to have the opportunity of revenging himself on his former master, Shapira, had guided the French consul, that's Claremont Gano, into the Bedouin's country and had actually helped him to secure a certain monolith which Mr. Benedictus himself had unearthed. Now, this is wow. clearly in context, is talking about the time frame 1868, there is an unearthing. Now, remember the story. According to Frederick, uh, uh, Frederick Klein. He found 19, it lying on the surface of the ground. It's, it's out of the ground. It has been exhumed from the earth. There were antiquarian researches going on in what is now known to be ancient Debon. Somebody was doing it. We know for a fact that Shapira was spending a lot of time east of the Jordan with Selim. They were doing antiquarian research. Now, get this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go a little bit further into the book and read this. To make matters worse, this is also from Little Daughter of Jerusalem, page 107. The Turkish government intervened. Remember the story I just told? Yeah. And laid claim to the ground where the excavations had been undertaken taking advantage of this pretext to levy a heavy tax on the rebellious tribe. Then it describes a skirmish that takes place between the soldiers of uh, the Ottomans and the desert dwellers led by mm. Amir bin Diab. Ali bin Diab is the known sheik 
of, of this particular tribe. And it says that during this time, he was slain. In the end, the Turks were driven back beyond the Jordan, but the Bedouins, convinced now that their misfortunes were due to the excavations, which had taken place among their ruins and other reasons, blew up all that remained of the latter with gunpowder, destroying several valuable specimens which had already been exhumed. I think Mm. this is her recollection of the story on the street, perhaps of her father, that he was the man. Can you imagine he's walking around the house, he's upset, and he says, "Uh, honey, you're not going to believe this, that French dragoman, Clermont Gano, has taken credit for Mm. the Moabite stone, which I undugged with uh, Ali uh, bin Diab. Yeah. And and so he's he's upset, and then she hears him saying, they blew it up. They blew it mm. into... <clears throat> so this story, now as far as the correlations between the, uh, the Mesha Stella and 2 Kings 3, uh, mm. just very generally we covered the highlights, that, that he, sure. Mesha in the Moabite stone, is saying that he brought forward all these uh, great successes, that he defeated Israel, that he pushed them back across, that he mm-hmm. he took control of what had been occupied at the time by Israelites, by Israelite tribes. All mm-hmm. of these things are corresponding to 2 Kings chapter 3. Uh, mm-hmm. even, even when he says basically that he chased them back, so says 2 Kings 3. Now, what I'm I'm presently working on, and I'll post this in uh, on Horev on the the Discord oh. channel for members of the Yakod, and then that way people can see that. But I I want to take and actually produce like we do so often, Jonah, on these shows, produce a handout that shows uh, highlighted the correlation between the two, and that's what I'm going to do uh, hopefully this week before our next show, if that's fair okay. enough. All right. Good deal. All right. So now, now listen, you yep. yeah, yeah, okay, go ahead. I, I was just gonna say, so the Moabite stone is the or one of the, if not the most significant archaeological discovery, again, in the 19th century, in the time mm-hmm. of Shapira. Shapira's actively part of this. We read, mm-hmm. we have accounts that that he is connected to it. And his associate, the guy he works with, Salim Alakari, is the one mm-hmm. who uh, gives to the banker who gives to Claremont Gano seven mm-hmm. lines of uh, transcription, which helped to put the message to the world. Now, the, the other interesting thing, and, and I want to make this very clear, is that when the Moabite stone becomes knowledge among the scholars, when scholars hear about this and articles Mm. and so forth are published, one thing strikes every one of them, and it begins with Klein's words. He believes that this is reason to go search east of the Jordan for other biblical treasures, for other evidences of biblical culture. 1868, Mm -hmm. Shapira enters officially into the antiquities trade in the mm. year 1871, in his shop, you can find, you could find, it was, believe me, remember, it, it was called, in Baddeker's Guide to the Holy Land, it was called the best mm. shop in Jerusalem. You would mm. find antiquities for sale on the shelves. Yep. And some mm-hmm. of these claim to be Moabite treasures. Yep. And I think... That's where we're probably going next week, if you're okay with that. This is definitely where we're going next week because we've run out of time. This is the uh, what became known as the Moabitica scandal. Uh, and we've been to uh, Jerusalem in search of some of these pieces, and we did find some. We're going to be talking about some of those uh, next week. And, um, and the race for, uh, for, for these sort of relics to, to uh, present them to people, have them for sale and put them in museums and so on and so forth. Uh, it, it it didn't slow down at all, and uh, it also didn't turn out too well. That's We're going right. to be talking about that next week. Now, Ross, you've made mention uh, on a number of occasions through the program to the Yachad. Just remind everybody, what is the Yachad? How can they be pa- uh, a part of that? 
the Yakad means together. We know the term from the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, written in the, by the community at Qumran. And, and what we do is we have a group that we want to make everything available to everyone at no charge, and we do that. People who want to watch this can watch it later, but we, we have a meeting with uh, the Yakad earlier. So, for instance, tonight, that's who's with us, those who financially support us. People can do that uh-huh. simply by joining the YouTube channel. They can join the Patreon at any level from bottom to top. All of it's important. All of it helps us. It helps me to keep my help satisfied and paid. And then the other thing that it does is it helps us to produce more videos. They can also join right on Discord. So there are plenty of ways to do it. Whatever level uh, works for somebody's budget. We appreciate it. We thank you. And that way, everybody can get good quality material. And that's what we're out, we're all about here. So. We, in a few minutes, are heading over to uh, the Yachad on Discord just to uh, engage in some Q&A uh, on this right. very topic that, that we presented to you today. Um, so that is that. We are going to go there very soon. But before we do, um, the Shabbat. What, 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 what is the uh, Shabbat class this, this uh, weekend, Ross? We're continuing. This will be the third Torah portion from the book of Exodus, from Shemot. We're following the annual cycle of readings. We call it a, the Pentateuch. A new look. We're getting to the point where Israel is leaving the land of Egypt. So uh, what these classes offer is my insights, uh, years of study in the Pentateuch and following the cycle of readings. Uh, Those classes are about an hour and 15 minutes. We're going to talk about the exodus, if you will. And then we meet live after the, Uh the playing, the premiere of the class. We meet live here in Discord, and we discuss the reading, and people can ask questions. They can uh, give their con- their comments, their take on the various things, and it is a fantastic time. So, join us Good this Saturday uh, on Ross K Nichols TV on YouTube for the class. And Seth has made it so easy that those who aren't part of the Discord are automatically directed to another YouTube program where they can watch the discussion on YouTube. They don't have to look. They can do this, Jonah. Just sit there, and they're carried magically to see the next. It's perfect. There you go. Uh, so finally, the eighty-first uh, UI conference is happening at the uh, in the latter half of this coming April. Um, is there still room, Ross? What, what there, are the there's numbers still, so far? There's still room. We're we're getting quite a bit of response, and I think. I thought it was people wanting to see me, but based on the inf- the emails I'm getting, when they they heard you were coming, they all of a sudden <laughs> the attendance picked up. So we're getting more and more going. people who are signing up. Oh, yeah, we're so, going for sure. Yeah. All right, so uh, I'm looking forward to seeing people um, uh, there. I'll be making a presentation as well. Really looking forward to it, uh, but places are filling. We do need to know that you are coming, if you are coming, so that we can make sure that you're catered for. It's free, but uh, we just need to make sure there's room and that you're catered for. So uh, register on the on the link that Ross is going to put in the uh, comment section there. And that is our program this week.